Hello and welcome to NASCOM Technology and Leadership Forum 2024. I'm Anisha Nair Dhawan. Today we are speaking to technology leaders to find out all the buzz in generative AI and how it is impacting businesses now and in the future. I have with me Senthil Ramani, Global Lead, Data and AI Accenture joining me now. Senth, thank you so much for joining us. What are the top three things in the minds of CXOs when they think of adopting generative AI in their businesses? Thanks so much for having me. In fact, recently uh, I just came back from Davos where we hosted over 160 you know, CEOs and CXOs. It was a very interesting exercise because we changed Davos this time from Accenture to run an academy to, l to have them teach uh, and learn on Gen AI. And, and it was an interesting experience because I would probably boil that down into, into kind of a few things that we learned. Number one was the value gap. A lot of the CEOs were asking about, you know, where do I apply Gen AI? And is there a strategic investment I can make in some places? Um, and the second question that we typically uh, were, got asked was on talent, effectively. And what are the gaps on talent that, that, is, that is there in the organizations today? And how do I, how do I fill those uh, gaps? The third is, as you know, data is the fuel. And it's yeah. a spotlight on data is right now there because of Gen AI. So the question is, what is the gap on data? What kind of foundation do I need to have and so on? And the last one is something that we all need to be working on is responsible AI. As you know, only 2% of the organizations globally have a systemic process end-to-end -end in place for responsible AI. So there's a lot of focus on responsible AI as well. Mm -hmm. You tell us questions, what were the answers? I mean, <laughs> they want to know, um, you know, about what are the pro use cases, processes where they can apply, you know, the gaps in the talent. Absolutely. Responsible AI, so what did you advise them? Got it. So the first one is on value. Uh, let's kind of go back to value uh, framing. The first important thing when, when you start to look at AI and Gen AI is that AI has existed for a long time. Hmm. So when you apply Gen AI and AI, in a lot of the situations, it comes in concert of each other. It's just not separately applying Gen AI alone. So that's, I think, the first one, right, and uh, first precedent. The second important thing is that when you start to apply AI and Gen AI, you got to look at two categories. Number one is table stakes. Table stakes are where we believe that the capabilities are proven and it's non-differentiating and you can start off. An example of that is customer service, for example, marketing contact centers, you can talk about legal services that are, you know, you're providing, some of the HR services, virtual concierge, et cetera, so on and so forth. And these are things you can start off right now. The economics of Gen AI is playing out quite well, and you can start to apply that. The second area is what I call strategic bets. Now, take life sciences company. Mm -hmm. Drug discovery is a strategic mm -hmm. bet for them. An energy company, capital pro project management would be you know, relevant for them. You take an insurance company, underwriting is mm -hmm. going to be you know, uh, the soul of uh, you know, some of their practices that they do. So those are the areas that we advise them you know, primarily in terms of strategic bets and table stakes. When it comes to talent primarily, and I'll talk to you about uh, a talent a little more on the transformation that we are doing, there was a lot of question in terms of, you know, is this going to be a displacement? Uh, is there going to be a difference in the role and the skilling? The answer is yes, there is going to be new skills that come in. There are going to be newer skills. But it's interesting and a statistic that I want to tell you, which is fairly alarming, which is less than 5% of organizations globally are actually spending time, energy, and capital on reskilling with Gen AI. Yeah, but there's no business, and you're saying reskill, and <laughs> they have to see cost benefit, right? Maybe it's just a thing of now when, you know, when it's, Business is slightly slow. Is that the case? Um, it, it is not the case because uh, primarily because you see that one of the key things that need to happen is you've got to future proof your organization and enterprises. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. AI is going to be there everywhere, mm -hmm. right? Whether you like it or not, we use it in personal lives and it's actually going to be used in the business life as well, right? Now, when you unpeel that uh, a bit and you go back into reinventors, you know, we ran a statistics across 1,500 companies, and which basically informed us that only 9% of those companies are what we call reinventors or fourth quadrant. And these are companies where the capital gains have been seen, the valuation is, is there, as well as there are TRS benefits they are starting to see as well. And if you go back to these 9%, they are using AI fundamentally as a catalyst for growth. That leaves you with 91% companies which still need to do that. Yes. And hence why you need to go back and invest in data, invest in talent, invest in responsible AI and the value as well. Right, so you did mention a few industries. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave some examples. Uh, what are the industries uh, where you are seeing traction with uh, generative AI? Could yeah. you give us more, uh, you know, you know, the names and perhaps some of the use cases also, which are not just you know beyond content generation, mm -hmm. uh, which are actually giving you some maybe revenue generation, new revenue streams. It's a great question. Um, if you really look at 
At Accenture, we are tracking 19 industries. I would say the top four industries are really the banking cluster and insurance cluster of capital markets where there's a lot of application of Gen AI. Um, the second industry I would uh, say is consumer and retail, mm. right? Because a lot of the consumer facing businesses, you know, hyper personalization, and I'll get into some examples for you. The third industry is life sciences, where we see a lot of these strategic bets coming in. And the fourth is software platform companies, which okay. need to adopt, you know, mm. Gen AI as well. If I wanted to give you some examples, there's a huge um, uh, opportunity that we started to work on in a US um, you know, insurance company. And we're starting to see, based on the underwriting work that we did and at scale in, in a production, um, we are starting to see almost a 10% you know, uplift on the revenue you know, for them on underwriting. So that's an example. The second one is the work that we are doing for a life sciences company around drug discovery processes and clinical trials. We are starting to see development cycles, you know, really cut by almost seven to ten months as as part of that process. So that's the second second probably example. The third one is in there in uh, in you know if you go back into consumer and retail mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. hyper personalization, the ability for the Gen AI to know you, mm -hmm. respond to you, and increase the relevance with which it talks to you and and engages with you mm -hmm. has gone up. And relevance is coming because of the context that you're able to field into those models yeah. right now with Gen AI. And those are three examples that we are so, starting to see. But is engagement <laughs> translating into dollars or more dollars in one Absolutely. Market? So the interesting thing about Gen AI is it's more human-like. It's like looking at the mirror. Mm. It's like more human-like than any other yeah, technology that you've seen. That's why people are seen. getting fooled, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they don't know if they're talking to a human <laughs> or a bot, right? But it is translating into... It is, because it understands the emotion far better. Because mm. Gen AI cracked the code on language, as mm. we all know. Mm. We've been doing 700 projects, by the way, on mm. Gen AI. Mm. Uh, over 30% of them are scaling, which means you know these are in production, et cetera, mm. so on and so forth. Yes, there is a lot more room to go because the technology is moving. But in areas where it's applied carefully with diligence across those four vectors I told you, which mm. is value, talent, data, and responsible AI, mm. we're starting to see the scale happen. Okay, I want to center back to scaling, because sure. you said uh, companies were uh, you know, thinking about how do they prepare their workforces for when JI is going to be everywhere. Yeah. So what are you advising your clients to do? Yeah. Now I'm sure your uh, people working at Accenture are really upskilling fast to be able to use and understand Gen AI. What about your clients? What should they do? It's a, it's a great point. I mean, let me start inward facing first and then I'll say what we're doing for our clients. We have a huge um, you know, philosophy that we want to do things to ourselves first, learn from it, mm -hmm. and make sure when we apply to our clients, we are contextual to them, mm -hmm. right, in so doing. And we started with Accenture. We have 40,000 people in our data and AI team. We're growing to 80,000 people. We're doubling our headcount. We're also investing, as you've probably seen, $3 billion mm -hmm. on Gen AI uh, in the next few years. And one of the first things we did was rotate our talent into R12. And R12 is the 12 required roles that you need for the future for Gen AI and for data. Mm -hmm. And we are now investing on the pathways for all of that, you know, across mm -hmm. the R12. And what we've also done is that we've taken the same philosophy now to our clients, you know, to train them and to educate them, like the example I gave you on, on Davos as well. Mm. Besides that, we have taken 250,000 people in Accenture into Gen AI proficiency learning as well at this point in time. Mm. So I, I'm sure everybody's very excited. Gen AI, I'm going to be able to engage with my customer better. Maybe new revenue streets will open up. But you said only 2% of companies are doing responsible AI. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that really part of the plan on their mindscape at all? And is it really important? It's it's a really important point because one of the key things that needs to happen in responsible AI, a lot of responsible AI today remains at policy. It needs to move from policy into practice into pioneering, if you will. And when I said 2% of companies who do systemically, effectively, these are the companies who are doing end-to-end -end tracking of responsible AI across their models and their data cycles and reporting back into their boards, right? And that's that's important because the loop, closing the loop is important. We do that at Accenture, uh, by the way. And it's an alarming statistic because the 98% of companies still need to create that end-to-end -end workflow for responsible AI because if you are as a consumer and you're going to a shop to buy something, you want to make sure that when you're doing that and the recommendation, like you said, coming from AI is explainable, it's fair, and it has no bias. Hmm. So it's going to be an underlying bedrock for any AI product in the future. Companies are cognizant of that or will that also have to be ingrained into them? This has to be ingrained mm -hmm. as much as data as, as well, yes. right? And the importance of data. I was telling mm -hmm. you the spotlight on data is there. And I think that's where the education begins right now. We've been you know, working with a lot of boards and C-suite right now to educate them on responsible AI. Mm -hmm. And I think that has definitely increased. Mm -hmm. We want it to be faster and more, but it's definitely increased. Okay. Beyond 2024, uh, how do you see generative AI evolving and impacting businesses, lives, industries? 
I think the fact is we need to go away from POC to scale. I mean, back to your point on scaling, it's such an important point. Uh, because that's when the belief will be there, and and the fact that you know this can truly, as a technology, uh, you know, make a material impact to the PNL is important, and we're starting to see that uh, happen, which is which is which is a good thing. I strongly believe Gen AI can help with the societal needs as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are situations where we've been using Gen AI now for doing things that have not been done in the past. Uh, this is about helping people who are you know primarily alone and depressed, and how Gen AI can actually help them, you know, in the in the process. The second thing is how Gen AI can actually help with identifying problems in the environment from a sustainability standpoint. Our work right now in the marine side in Australia and in mm -hmm. Philippines has been helping to you know, improve the situation for marine life with, uh, with Gen AI and the information that we get. I think there's a significant amount of opportunities we can do from a societal perspective with AI and Gen AI specifically. It sounds very interesting and it sounds uh, something which is going to be very sustainable and uh, something that everybody would themselves want should it happen in a responsible fashion. Thank you so much, Sintha, for speaking with Thanks us. Thanks for having me. It was wonderful talking to you.